Thanks, uh, Professor Kanakara. Um, distinguished guests and uh, my fellow professionals, it's a, it's a really great privilege to, uh, to be here with you today. Thank you. Uh, just before I commence, I, I'd like to acknowledge uh, CORSA's efforts in putting the, uh, the seminar together today. Um, it's, it's just superb um, to, uh, to be here and to, uh, to have her, uh, her work recognised for, uh, for putting all this together. And the, uh, the young gentleman who are uh, over from the academy speaking as well, what, uh, what a, uh, an auspicious occasion it is for you. Thank you. <coughs> Our topic's air power, um, specifically Australian air power, and uh, I'd like to speak for 20 minutes on the notion of technology and conflict and how that relates to, uh, uh, to the subject. Uh, it seems to me that 100 years this year, uh, a century of professional practice is a very good place to pause and reflect. Uh, in fact, 100 years is probably a very good time for any theory to, to refine and, and take shape. As this goes, the, uh, the derived wisdom is that air power has evolved over the last century so that it can realise effects across the spectrum of conflict at any one time. Uh, that's a very powerful instrument for our, uh, our nation and uh, that's uh, central to the theme today. I just want to do a bit of groundwork before we get into that subject. Uh, I'd like to convey to you the essential notion of balance and air power and how the two go hand in hand. Balance is an ability to conduct the numerous roles and missions that are associated with our discipline all at once. That compiles high technical, logistics and engineering standards and we need effective training and command and control systems in place. The overriding requirement for us as a small air force and a small defence force though is uh, for air power to be inherently joint, integrated and interoperable in a wider international context. That requires us to be at the forefront of the opportunities and challenges that are associated with uh, aviation technology. So with that in mind, I've got a couple of propositions for you. I consider this, uh, this statement on the screen to be self-evident, but it's, it's well worth exploration. Uh, as a professional aviator, I think it's essential to appreciate the manner in which Australia's air power technology is acquired. Um, that's, that's knowledge that we all should have. Um, the platforms on the screen that you can see there, they're also iconic as well. Saltwith, um, later Hawker, uh, the Royal Aircraft Factory uh, was very influential a hundred years ago on Armstrong Whitworth, de Havilland, AB Row, and of course you can see Bristol uh, in the Bristol F2B fighter on the lower right side of your screen. That was the, uh, the, uh, the Super Hornet of its day, if you like. <clears throat> Just uh, I'd like you to remember those companies in the, uh, the context of what we're going to, uh, to chat about. The second proposition is uh, very much related to the first, but uh, I need to contextualise that for you. And uh, uh, to do so, I'll take you on a, uh, a slight journey um, for a couple of slides, and that's central to our understanding of Australia's air power and its, uh, its role as well. Uh, the images that you see around the screen, they're also fascinating as well. Uh, that is 100 years, 80 years, if you like, you can see uh, the exponential growth and development of air power technology uh, in that 80 years. It's also a reflection of Australia's foreign policy. You can see a shift from by British, with a slight segue into France there, to, uh, to our coalition efforts with the United States today. But I'll start with, uh, with this British world. That's the British Empire 100 years ago, folks. Um, it was a, uh, an economic and territorial network that was linked and enabled to function by rapid advances among steamships, railways, postal and communication services, and by the English language 
and British banking and business and the, uh, the governmental organisation there as well. Um, the British world was uh, the world of 1900 in many respects. The British gold standard underwrote the economy of the planet. That's what I'm talking about there. This was a British world and we were a part of it. Our contribution as a dominion in that construct uh, is painted in this picture and a picture paints a thousand words. Um, sugar, beef, mutton, wool, wheat, gold, coal, minerals. Uh, oh yeah, a supply system, uh, untold wealth from Australia into the British world and of course that wealth was reinvested in Australia, so much so that we've enjoyed one of the highest standards of living in the world uh, in our federated history. That's what we got in return. All the technical, economic, social and cultural benefits of belonging to the British Empire. Um, Harland and Wolf, that, <laughs> that company built the Titanic, perhaps I shouldn't have put that up there, but um, what you can see is uh, the highest technical standards of the day. And uh, um, recall those companies, Sopwith, Hawker, De Havilland, AB Road, etc., etc. They were the leading edge technology of 100 years ago and that was our return for being a part of the, uh, the British world. I'll just let you uh, read through those notes on the screen. I'd like to talk with you about what they mean. When a nation, when Australia is in receipt of the latest cutting edge technology such as air power, and we show a willingness to employ it, then we join a networked force. It was that way 100 years ago, I will show you that shortly, and it's that way today. That's a microcosm of our foreign policy, and it's a self-perpetuating process. So buying British technology 100 years ago in support of the empire uh, was every bit as important as the way in which contemporary Australia acquires air power or defence technology now. It's a part of our organising principle, if you wish. I'd like to chat about this chap on the right as well, Sir Richard Williams. He was the founding father of the RAAF, formed in 1921, so we're nearly at a centenary now. Um, he was a tireless champion of air power, uh, and it's possible that the Air Force wouldn't have survived without his leadership in the 1920s. For those of you in the know, uh, his autobiography was titled, These Are Facts. That's why I put that on the screen. Um, Williams describes how air power was instrumental in the destruction of the Turkish army during the Great War. That's not supposition. Uh, as Dickie Williams would have stated, that is a fact. And it's a fact that our ties to a powerful ally resulted in the first decisive and independent defeat of land forces from the skies. Uh, that is a bookend for our brief this morning and uh, I'd like to chat with you about that now. The Agamemnon. That's a, uh, a British vessel. The Turkish uh, surrendered unconditionally at Madras Harbour in, on Lemnus Island uh, in the Aegean Sea on the 30th of October. Uh, King Agamemnon defeated the Anatolian Turks at Troy uh, 3,000 years ago. I don't know if the Admiralty actually realised that, but they, um, they sent that vessel there to accept the Turkish surrender. What's that got to do with air power? Five weeks earlier, Australian air power was central to that defeat. In 1918, British air power in Palestine was uh, comprised of a, brigade, a brigade, two wings of, uh, of aircraft, and uh, uh, number 41 wing, uh, 40 wing was central to its, uh, its operational construct. The, operate, uh, the OC was Lieutenant Colonel Richard Williams, the Australian, of course. He had three squadrons at his disposal. Uh, one squadron, AFC, is still in the RAAF as one squadron, RAAF, and two Royal Air Force squadrons. Uh, his inventory 
comprised thoroughly modern aircraft. The Bristol Fighter, SE-5s and uh, de Havilland 9 light bombers. It was a first-rate organisation and what you see on the screen is a product of that, uh, that British world. I'll just orientate this, uh, this chart for you here. They're the Bible lands. Um, on the west, to the left of your screen, that's the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, that was Palestine 100 years ago. It's, it's modern day Israel. You can see uh, the Red Sea, bottom dead centre of the map with the River Jordan running north-south through the, uh, uh, the centre of the screen there. Uh, Jerusalem was captured by uh, British forces in December 1917 and the Turks had fixed defences across uh, the screen to the south of Nablus, which is still a troubled town, of course, um, in uh, September 1918. On the 19th of September, um, just over 100 years ago, so Edmund Allenby launched an offensive along the plains of Sharon, the coastal plains there, uh, against the Ottomans, and he drove northwards and then turned east towards Nablus, and you can see further north through the, uh, the township of Jenin there as well. Um, the battle became known as the, uh, the Battle of Megiddo, and you can see that just above the red arrow on your screen. Now I'm told Megiddo, it's an actual village in modern day Israel, that's a Queensland pronunciation. In fact, the, uh, the Semitic tongue uh, called it the village on the hill Har, Har Megiddo. That's the Armageddon of biblical fame. So Armageddon uh, is, is Megiddo, uh, as I would say it from Rockhampton. But back to our story. The, uh, the Turks unraveled. What they did was uh, uh, stream eastwards towards the Jordan River uh, along uh, the, the narrow roads and the wadis, the dry creek beds to, uh, to get away from the air power that was chasing them and the ground forces that were following up. The wadi Farah, you can see indicated on your screen, uh, runs away to the River Jordan and it's difficult to, uh, to see, but you can see a, uh, a thin road along the top of this precipitous gorge down in here. That's the, uh, the Wadi Farah. Another image of it taken by one squadron at the time. You can see just how troubled that countryside is. On the 21st of September 1918, two Bristol fighters from one squadron uh, sighted that column um, and uh, they bombed the head of it. There were 7,000 troops on that roadway. That stopped any forward progress. They then expended their, uh, their ammunition, 600 rounds, into the, uh, the column of horses, troops and wagons. They had nowhere to move and they signalled back to Williams at 40 Wing with the details and Williams then relayed aircraft over the top so that there were aircraft over the top of this column from 40 Wing for the rest of the day. One squadron on the 21st of September, dropped three tonnes of ordnance alone and it expended 24,000 rounds of machine gun fire. Um, the wing, uh, something exponential to that. The nature of the terrain, as you can imagine, allowed no movement and the result was as uh, chilling as it's decisive. Uh, these images were taken on the day. You can imagine what was going on. Um, all those images were taken in the aftermath and the destruction was so bad uh, that when British troops caught up the next day, they counted about 6,000 uh, casualties among the 7,000 Turks uh, there. Williams was advised not to let his crews go to observe uh, their handiwork because it was so distressing. I'm just going to, uh, to pause and reflect now on the nature of our profession. These are the wars of my generation and some of these images are mine, some aren't. Um, on, on one level, we should be disturbed by the Wadi Farah. We should be disturbed by these images as well. Uh, even with the addition of the air domain, war still remains war. It's unchanging, it's disturbing. It's violent, 
destructive, brutal, irrational, and that's even when it's initially committed with good intentions. Now, as a professional, as, as professionals, we might debate on the morality of that, and that's good that we do so. We shouldn't commit to war unless it's a last resort, but it's a sidebar issue. While air power might refine a conflict, um, the discourse on the nature of war will not prevent it from occurring. So um, that matter rests with me now, and there are my thoughts on the subject. In 100 years since Awadi Farah, air power technology has developed to take advantage of those characteristics that you can see on the screen. All of the domains have specific characteristics. This is what we bring to the table, and this is what technology has uh, enabled. The information age today is going to herald another great leap forward. That's what I'm putting to you. Where that leads is yet to be seen, but I think that space and cyberspace are more and more central to the discipline, and precision and uh, satellite-driven communications and munitions are very much a part of that. I just want to talk to you, or with you, very quickly about how fast that's occurred. Five years after we flew Bristol box kites, we were operating the Bristol fighter. You can see those images on your screen. 50 years later, in 1968, our airmen and soldiers were operating in conjunction in South Vietnam uh, with helicopter technology. That was 50 years ago. It's now 2018. Um, I want you to think about how quickly that's occurred. Now, try to think about where we're going to be in 2068. That's, uh, that is something that is uh, exponential and something that is yet to be realised. All of this stuff's taken out of the white paper. Fascinating. We don't live in a British world anymore, but our defence arrangements aren't markedly different to the way they were 100 years ago. We enjoy the protection of deterrence through our alliance with the United States, and that's central to our maintenance of a technical edge. I want you to think of the subtext and the points on the screen there. Interoperability affords us access to high-end capabilities that would be beyond our reach otherwise. Investing in high-end multi-role technology is important because we contribute to a rules-based global order because we've got the technology. And to do that, we operate across the spectrum. This is air power, but uh, across the spectrum from humanitarian all the way through to high-end kinetic operations. The ability to conduct these functions unilaterally or all at once makes our discipline invaluable to a joint and coalition force. We're going to hear a lot about that from the, uh, the young chaps later on today, but uh, uh, I'm mentioning it uh, to you now. Um, and I'll say it again, interoperability for us is the key. Interoperability allows our forces to integrate into a coalition on operations to enhance the whole picture. That's not a, uh, a matter of physical and technical integration by itself, that's a cognitive process as well. And I mean common processes, an air-minded approach, and an understanding of how the concept of air power fits into a wider power construct, a national or international um, power construct. Let's uh, bookend at the other end, the Wadi Farah, with this latest example. That date again, the 21st of September, 1918, juxtaposed with the 21st of September, 2014, 96 years later, the RAAF deployed six Super Hornets, again from one squadron, with the Cross of Jerusalem on the, uh, the, the tail of the aircraft uh, because of its heritage, a KC-38 tanker and an E-7 wedge tail platform against ISIL in northern Iraq. A hundred years later, from a standing start in two days, this air task group and its support personnel moved to an international base 12,000 kilometres from home and they are ready to uh, uh, conduct operations almost immediately. What a superb effort. The group was a, uh, a system 
of platforms. It integrated directly into a coalition. At the same time, it retained its autonomy as a national contingent. And I want to take that idea further for you now. Our air power is moving to a fifth generation concept where all these systems can be fully integrated. A fully networked force can explore, uh, exploit shared data and uh, that data generated by the like systems will build the greatest possible situational awareness for everybody who's integrated there. The platforms are fully networked by cyber and satcom and uh, they comprise data, sensors and command and control systems. Where is that going to take us? Ten years ago, uh, a US aviator said, we live in a future that our predecessors have built with jets, missiles, space operations, precision guided mu munitions and cyber warfare. I, I think that we're, we've uh, already moved beyond that future. Um, networks today will form, or in future will form in cyberspace, and space-based systems will become intrinsic to our operations. Uh, I think that in future cyber may even be the leading domain in that construct. Um, if you think that in 75 years we've had five generations of air power, it's uh, likely that in the next 50 years there'll be at least several more. So where that's taking us is uh, up to our imagination. I'm going to uh, conclude with this image, another fascinating image 100 years old. Uh, this is the Australian Corps Memorial at a, uh, a village called Hamel in uh, northern France. Uh, the Australians conducted an operation there on the 4th of July 1918 um, as a part of this British world. Um, this image shows the way things were 100 years ago, but it's fascinating because it's a portent of the way things were going to be. Uh, the United States operated with Australians for the first time uh, on that date and um, uh, the image says it all for us. Our, um, our, our uh, uh, high-end multi-role technological developments are an extension of what you can see on the screen. Now, uh, a couple of the coming speakers are going to highlight the advantages and challenges uh, to Australia within the framework of what I've discussed today. Um, some will stress the inherently joint nature of our discipline and how the domains uh, integrate. But what I hope I've conveyed for you is that all of these matters can't be appreciated unless they're in the context of wider events. Um, folks, thank you very much for your time. I'd be pleased to take any questions if you have any. Thank you.